HPN's um, interdisciplinary panel discussion on borderline personality disorder. Uh, we have uh, over 230 people um, logging into this webinar tonight. Uh, we have a very talented panel. I'll just introduce them all to you. Um, we have Dr. Christine McAuliffe, who's a, a GP from Brisbane. She is a GP advisor to uh, primary mental health care with the Australian Divisions of General Practice. And Chris has a strong interest in primary mental health care. Uh, the next person whom you'll see just down from Chris, um, who's just drinking out of his glass at the moment, is Dr. Chris Lee. He's a clinical psychologist um, from Perth. Um, he's now program chair in clinical psychology at Murdoch University. Uh, he's had extensive training from leading figures in DBT and has been accredited in schema-focused therapy by the International Society of Schema Therapists. Uh, the next person you'll see there is uh, Jan McMahon. Jan is a consumer advocate. Uh, she's worked within the mental health area as a consumer advocate since 1997. She founded the Private Mental Health Consumer Care Network in 2002, which is a recognized national organization. She's appeared before six parliamentary inquiries and has been a member of a number of Australian government committees and expert reference groups, including that for borderline personality disorder. Um, she's been awarded the Medal of the Order of Australia in recognition of her advocacy, advocacy work. Uh, and next we've got, next, last but not least, is uh, Dr. Andrew Channon. He is a psychiatrist from Melbourne. Um, he's a senior lecturer um, at Origin Youth Health Research Centre um, and is attached to the University of Melbourne. He holds clinical appointments as associate director, uh, as associate medical director, Origin Youth Health, Health Clinical Program, and is a consultant psychiatrist at the Adolescent Forensic Health Service in Melbourne. Uh, he is president of the International Society for the Study of Personality Disorders and was chair of the organising committee for the 12th International ISSPD Congress. I'd just like you to um, welcome everybody. Um, I will just go briefly through the structure of tonight's um, um, session. Um, after the introduction, um, we will be hearing uh, initially from Dr. Uh, Christine. Excuse me. Um, after the introduction, uh, we will be hearing from um, Jan McMahon, who will give us a uh, uh, and, and her introduction um, from the viewpoint of a consumer. We will then move on to uh, Dr. Andrew Channon's um, uh, input um, as a psychiatrist. We will then hear from Dr. Chris Lee, um, a psychologist with an interest in borderline personality disorder. And then to wrap it up, we will have um, Dr. Christine McCall of a GP from Brisbane. We will then go into a um, a session where your questions will be put through me uh, to the panel. Um, and then we'll have a summing up at the end, and we should be finished by 7.30. So I think we will ask you, I will just go through the introduction here, the introduction from MHPN. Um, the, we have a number of learning objectives that we're going to, um, that we're hoping to, uh, to achieve tonight. The first learning objective um, is to recognize the ways in which uh, clinicians um, and or treatment teams may be challenged when providing um, mental health treatment and care to borderline personality uh, disorder presentations. And the second um, learning objective is to acquire strategies to build individual and team resilience. Should you wish to find out more about your individual CBT, CPD recognition, please visit the MPHN site. So we have a facilitated interdisciplinary panel discussion, and then we have a Q and A from uh, from you good people who have um, who have joined us. We have um, now. Um, over 225 people logged in, so I think that things have probably slowed down a little bit from when we first um, trialed this before the session. 
So I'll moderate the panel discussion and field questions from the audience. Um, submit your, your questions via the, um, the box in the bottom right-hand corner. Ensure your sound is on and the volume is turned up on your computer. If you're continuing to have problems, uh, please phone the 1-800 number at the bottom of this page, 1-800-733-416. Christine, can you still hear me? I, I can hear you, Michael, but yes. uh, I've just dropped out. Sorry. Uh, Don't worry. Look, at the, I'm, I'm a GP, and this happened to the GP on the last session, so maybe, it's, maybe it's a plot. Okay. We're ready to go into our panel presentations. Um, are you comfortable there, Christine, with that, that um, video? I'll yes. try and get it back on for you, but I'm not sure whether we will be able to. Okay. Okay, Jan. Look, thanks, Michael. Um, this is a very new frontier for me, being able to be involved in something such as this, so thank you very much. Um, look, I've been advocating for folk with a BPD uh, diagnosis for probably particularly so the last um, three years or so. And I, in that uh, course, I've talked to many, many people, including their carers. So. What I'd like to focus on tonight, if, if I could, is, is just to look at sort of what, what makes people with BPD tick. <clears throat> and I think one of the things that I really want to get across is that having BPD is not deliberate. People don't choose to have this disorder. Um, and part of the, the issues that, that people describe is, is having this ache, this internal pain that is constant, that, that doesn't matter what they do to, to ease that pain, it becomes almost impossible. Um, <clears throat> or they can be contrary and feel absolutely nothing. So people can go through their life not reacting to the death of loved ones or uh, things such as that. <clears throat> I think another issue for folks that, uh, that I've talked to is the inability to trust. Um, I think for a lot of folk, the, the boundaries have been uh, bulldozed through. So trust is a, a really major issue. Anger also is a really major issue um, in terms of the anger is, is so extreme that it and lasts for, for so long that physical symptoms come out of that. Um, you know, the, the heart races, uh, the, the feeling of of ill, really feeling ill, etc. So anger is certainly um, part of the, the whole spectrum of BPD. Heightened overwhelming emotions, you would, you would be aware of all of, of these things, so none of this is coming as any um, surprise to anyone, I, I feel sure. But in terms of, um, of a natural and a normal reaction to various um, things that happen in people's lives, People with BPD, it's heightened, it's, it's double, it's quadruple the, the effects that we might have as a, you know, or, or that people might have as a, as a normal response to things. And, and their life is in complete turmoil. The, the more um, uh, severe the condition, it, it relates to relationships, to work, where, where work, uh, really employment becomes almost impossible children living in this, this sort of a, a chaotic um, environment um, are, are really at risk, I think, and, and if we talk to some of the experts, we can quite clearly see that, that um, there's concern about the next generation. So, um, Michael, could you just go to the next slide, please? No worries. Janet, I'll let you move the slides from now on, if you like. Okay. Well, well, I'll try. <laughs> Good on you. So, <clears throat> what do you folk as clinicians say and, and how are behaviours particularly challenging to, to you as clinicians? Do you see people that you don't particularly like or people that you feel great compassion for um, or people who are, are a real challenge to you? I think if we look at, and I go back to this internal pain, that, that the actions around self-harm, now whether that's cutting or burning or other types of self-harm, are in order to, 
to ease that awful, awful constant internal pain, or actually on the complete reverse, to actually feel feel something. Uh, there's something about um, needing to to divert the feelings to actually a physical um, response to to self harm. Threatened suicide, people feel as though life is just too overwhelming and too chaotic and, and often think and feel about suicide, though not really wanting to die. This happens to many, although we do know that the, the risk of suicide is very high for, for people with BPD. So as clinicians, I'm sure that um, many missed appointments um, are the bane of your life. Um, in terms of when people are actually feeling okay and in control, they feel that they don't actually need uh, clinician support. Uh, then something happens, the old emotions flow, um, and then they're in crisis, uh, that turmoil, that internal turmoil, and they really require instant access. Flashing out is, a, is another really um, uh, reasonable, well, it's a, it's a response I'm sure that you all um, feel and have come against for many, many times the anger issue and for our GPs who, who may be on this webinar, there are many other health issues that people present to you. <coughs> um, there we go. So why do people act this way? I guess the message that I'd like to get across is that people do whatever they need need to, just in order to ease that pain. And I keep coming back to that because I'm not sure that people and, and clinicians necessarily have a sense that, that it is a pain. It's it's an ache. It's it's there, and and you know there's not an awful lot that people can do about it. And again, actually feel something. So really, we're looking at. Um, uh, They'll do whatever they need to do to, to lessen these emotions that flood them, that, that overwhelm them, in order to regain a sense of order, uh, an order in their life, um, in order in, in the moment, order in what they're um, trying to do at that particular time, in order to feel back in control. I think that's probably what people do in, in the main. So in terms of my next slide, um, so how will you as clinicians respond to people with PD? I guess the, the, the question and the, the plea that I would have to you as clinicians is please avoid perpetuating the fundamental feelings that people with BPD have. They feel fundamentally evil, fundamentally bad. The feeling of abandonment, whether it's real or, or imagined, is there. They have been invisible, ignored and alone in many, many situations. So um, how will you respond? I would hope that you would respond with empathy and with understanding. Um, I think something that is really important is that um, as clinicians you have firm but compassionate boundaries. Um, and I think that recovery uh, for people with BPD really does depend on choices and that can be choices of treatment modalities, choices of individual clinicians, choices of how, what and where uh, that treatment might be um, delivered. So from, here with me, I'm just getting the next slide, so that there are three messages that if, if nothing else, if I can't get anything else across to you, it would be that I would really ask um, that you, you have a, a, an understanding or at least a recognition that people don't choose to have BPD. And the second point is that people do whatever they need to do in order to survive. That's very real and that's a very real fact. And I think also, people do recover. They do recover. I know many, many people out there with a BPD diagnosis. And whilst that pain is still there, they still go on to lead um, meaningful lives in the community. They have relationships. They work. Their kids are okay. 
So I think it's really important to remember that when we talk about the BPD diagnosis that people can and do recover. So they would be the key messages that, um, that I'd particularly be pleased to get across. So thank, thank you, Michael. Thank, thank you very much, Jan. Um, that was uh, a very eloquent um, presentation. And I think it really sets the, the scene now. Uh, and I'll just go over our learning objectives again for tonight. We, we would like to, to come away from this tonight, recognizing the ways in which clinicians and our treatment teams may be challenged when providing mental health treatment and care to borderline personality disorder presentations. And secondly, we would hope to acquire strategies to build individual and team resilience. And I think that really sets the, um, the, the scene. Can everybody still hear me? We seem to have had a little bit of a glitch there. Yes. Yes? Yeah. Good. Okay, Andrew, um, you're on next. I'll leave you to go on to the next slide. You should be able to move it yourself. There's about a five-second lag. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, and uh, it's a real pleasure to be here to, uh, to be able to uh, uh, participate in this webinar tonight. Um, what I'd like to do is uh, go over some basics, not assume that everybody knows what we're talking about, but go over some basics and really give people the message that although challenging, there are basic things that uh, every clinician can do uh, that can actually improve the lives of people with, uh, with borderline personality disorder. You don't have to be practicing one of the major therapies in order to do good clinical work uh, with people with borderline personality disorder. So just to remind people that there are nine diagnostic criteria, I'm not going to dwell on that. What I am going to dwell on for a minute is that clinically uh, it's very helpful to think of those uh, nine criteria in four main domains, the affective domain, the cognitive domain, uh, the behavioural and the interpersonal. And although there is a lot of emphasis in borderline personality disorder these days on the affective domain, there is actually good evidence that all these domains are important in the understanding and treatment of uh, borderline personality disorder and that in fact uh, there is uh, uh, also supporting evidence to suggest that it might be seen from any one of those perspectives as a disorder of interpersonal functioning, functioning, a disorder of poor impulse control, uh, a, a cognitive disorder, or an affective disorder. Okay. It's also a common disorder. Uh, there are approximately 320,000 uh, uh, youth and uh, adult Australians who have borderline personality disorder. The prevalence is highest in uh, young people and then drops off with every decade. Overall, the uh, prevalence is around about 1.5% uh, uh, in adults, but it's very common in psychiatric uh, uh, settings such that uh, you um, uh, see uh, borderline personality disorder in uh, around about 20% of outpatients. It varies according to the study, but uh, uh, some are as low as 10%, some are much higher, but on average around about 20% of psychiatric outpatients. These patients are already out there, they're already coming to see uh, everyday you know, working clinicians, uh, and that's why uh, uh, um, seminars such as this evening's are important uh, in order to understand uh, the disorder and to uh, try and mount some kind of uh, clinical response that is effective uh, uh, across the health system. We're not going to be able to ever deliver uh, evidence-based uh, psychotherapies to every person with borderline personality disorder. But by the same token, we also don't need to deliver uh, the most um, uh, intensive and expensive forms of treatment to every person with diabetes or heart disease either. Uh, um, interventions need to be uh, uh, delivered according to uh, the severity and phase of 
of an individual uh, disorder. CPD is really a, a major um, public health problem and uh, know that uh, the functional impairments that are associated with borderline personality disorder are both severe but also more stable than the diagnosis itself. Uh, the diagnosis, uh, the DSM diagnosis, is actually quite unstable, but that doesn't mean that people recover functionally from the disorder. Uh, the disability that is associated with borderline personality disorder is often for decades, and there are now a number of high-quality longitudinal studies that have shown this. Uh, people with borderline personality disorder live persistently disabled lives, even if they no longer meet the diagnostic criteria for the disorder. We also know that people with borderline personality disorder are not indestructible, as, uh, as one of the clinical myths suggests. Um, the suicide rate for borderline personality disorder is around about um, uh, is around about eight to ten percent, which is about the same as uh, as that for schizophrenia. Uh, we know that the disorder itself has a negative effect on the course of depressive disorders. That people with borderline personality disorder use treatments, not just mental health treatments, but physical health treatments, general practitioner visits, at very high rates, and that this is a highly costly disorder to, uh, to society uh, at large. One of the uh, uh, areas that, that I have particular interest in and that we've published on extensively is that the diagnosis can be uh, made uh, in teenagers or from teenagers. It's been acknowledged for uh, decades now that the disorder emerges during uh, uh, adolescence and young adulthood, but there's been tremendous reluctance to make the diagnosis. Um, this is a demographically crowded period of life, and there's a huge potential for ensuing developmental disruption if the diagnosis is not made and the disorder not treated. Uh, there has always been the capacity within the DSM to uh, uh, make the diagnosis, but there is a kind of myth about that um, it's uh, prevented or precluded by the DSM. In fact, it is acknowledged that the diagnosis can be made, but there's been a wealth of evidence over the last 10 years to suggest that the disorder is no less reliable or valid in adolescents than it is in adults. And we also know that early intervention is possible, that, and we've demonstrated a kind of proof of concept that this can be done. So I would encourage clinicians who are um, attending tonight to uh, uh, if they want to follow up on this, uh, to uh, make the diagnosis and to uh, offer treatment when the disorder first uh, presents itself. We also know that assessment is often done uh, in, in a manner that is um, uh, fairly rapid and, and the pressures of, uh, of clinical work are, are very great. But it is important to remember that not every patient who gets under your skin has borderline personality disorder. So it is important to conduct a, a thorough and a rigorous assessment. And really the primary task of assessment for, for borderline personality disorder is distinguishing stuff from tray. That is, distinguishing the kinds of behaviours particularly that you see in borderline personality disorder, uh, that they occur in a person's usual manner of relating to others and relating to themselves, not that it is uh, confined to periods of depression, bipolar disorder, uh, or uh, uh, psychosis for that matter. People who behave in or, or uh, uh, engage uh, in, uh, in the kind of interpersonal relationships that characterize uh, personality disorder in an intermittent way that is confined to periods of mental state disorder don't have the disorder. It does need to be present in between episodes of mental state disorder. It clearly doesn't go away during uh, episodes of mental state disorder, but it does um, uh, uh, get exacerbated by uh, depression, uh, anxiety disorders, and, uh, and other uh, mental state disorders. And I think the key message, and uh, I think uh, everybody on the panel uh, will, uh, will be backing this up tonight, but the key message is that treatment is effective uh, and that there are several specific forms of psychotherapy that uh, appear to be beneficial for at least uh, 
some of the problems associated with borderline personality disorder. All those in the field acknowledge that the treatments need to improve and need to be better. Um, and one of the, um, uh, one of the important uh, uh, pieces of, uh, of evidence from literature is that uh, um, meta-analyses and guidelines have uh, uh, recommended that there is no one specific uh, form of psychotherapy that is more effective than another. It's likely that most of the evidence-based uh, 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 individual psychotherapies or uh, uh, treatment packages are effective uh, and that uh, there is no evidence to suggest uh, uh, favouring one over the other. There are certainly situations in which one might be uh, more helpful than the other, uh, but uh, the uh, NICE guideline in the UK, which is the only current uh, uh, international guideline for the treatment of borderline personality disorder, didn't uh, recommend any specific treatment, and I think rightly so, uh, because the evidence is, uh, is limited and, and can't suggest that. Another important um, uh, synthesis of the evidence is that there is very poor evidence for the effectiveness of pharmacotherapy as a, a primary treatment for borderline personality disorder. And most authorities would recommend that it should largely be avoided and that particularly because of the risks of polypharmacy, uh, that uh, the use of medication as a primary treatment uh, should be very limited. Um, however, uh, on the, uh, on the other hand, there is a, a strong case for using evidence-based treatments for co-occurring syndromes. Some uh, uh, um, uh, patients with borderline personality disorder encounter a kind of clinical uh, attitude that all the problems that they have must be due to the borderline syndrome. And so they don't, in fact, get uh, um, evidence-based treatment for co-occurring mood or anxiety disorders or uh, for that matter, bipolar disorder or psychotic disorders. Uh, so it is important uh, uh, that the message is clear that this is about pharmacotherapy for BPD as a, a primary uh, treatment. Um, Co-occurring syndromes should be treated at face value. So what are the general principles that uh, people might take away this evening? You're going to hear later about uh, more about uh, specific forms of psychotherapy, but what can working clinicians or teams in uh, general mental health services do uh, to provide effective treatment. And these are some of the principles that are effective uh, across uh, the range of evidence-based treatments uh, and the principles that uh, guidelines uh, for the treatment of borderline personality disorder would endorse. The first thing is that patients need access to services. Denying patient services on the basis of uh, 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 behavioural disturbance or self-harm uh, is, of course, the least helpful thing that you can do for someone with borderline personality disorder. All the key interventions have a model of, uh, of borderline personality disorder. Now, that might be as simple as understanding the disorder itself and applying uh, the DSM uh, diagnostic criteria. Certainly, there are theories of borderline personality disorder. <laughs> of the disorder itself. Comprehensive assessment goes without saying, but, uh, but as I've alluded to before, including co-occurring problems and making a full assessment of those is an important part of, of assessment. The next principle is that of non-judgmental acknowledgement and acceptance of, uh, of the individual's experience, wants and needs. This is common to uh, a, range of, um, uh, a range of treatments. Uh, uh, those familiar with dialectical behaviour therapy will be familiar with the term validation, but it's a common principle across a number of treatments. And the, the general attitude is that, as Jan was suggesting earlier, people with borderline personality disorder are doing the best that they can manage, um, but the best that they can manage is clearly not enough uh, to get by in life. Uh, so they need to, uh, to uh, make changes and to improve, but they're not doing this deliberately uh, to get under your skin. The next is, what kind of relationship do you need to have with someone with borderline personality disorder? This is clearly probably the biggest challenge because the disorder itself mitigates against uh, uh, smooth, 
reciprocal relationships. Um, but the aim is for an open, empathic and collaborative relationship and importantly optimism. People do get better from borderline personality disorder and again respecting the autonomy and choice of the individual with the disorder. Structure and consistency are, um, are really uh, bedrocks of, uh, of any treatment program uh, and uh, the, important, uh, the importance of structure and consistency is not just what you do but also what you don't do. That uh, people get into difficulties particularly when they're highly reactive to crises uh, and particularly self-harm uh, but also get into difficulties uh, when transitions or endings are not anticipated and managed uh, as part of the, uh, the therapeutic relationship. Andrew, um, we're just uh, a little bit time constrained, so I'm going to have to ask you to, um, to um, expedite yourself through your next few slides, and then we'll oh, have Chris. Okay. okay. The, um, the uh, uh, other principles are that one needs to attend to case management needs and care planning. These are the practical issues that people with borderline personality disorder come with, and also clearly delineating the roles uh, and uh, uh, the roles and um, uh, responsibilities of uh, individuals uh, in a team. Uh, and then uh, also to, um, uh, as you can see, the slides seem to have slipped forward, but a common team approach, uh, supervision and team support are again uh, important principles um, of treatment. Sorry, they've gone back again now. Uh, now it's going forward. Into co-occurring psychopathology, uh, treating co-occurring syndromes at face value. I seem to have got stuck. That's okay. You can still talk. Okay. Well, if we're, if we're constrained for time... Uh, yeah, we are a little bit constrained. So we might just pop on to your last um, slide, and then we can hear from Chris. Um, the, are you able to put that on? Because, uh, the I general psychiatric you. management? Yeah. If you're able to move it to the next one. Yeah, please. I can move it to the next one for you. Thank you. Thank Can you see it now? Yep, I can. Thank you. The last, um, the, the last issue here is really what kind of structure does, um, does, does good enough treatment need to have? Uh, and John Gunderson has described uh, general psychiatric management, which uh, uh, has been demonstrated in, uh, in one randomized controlled trial to be equal to... Um, I can only give you another minute, I'm afraid. I, I know this is distressing for you, but you will have to... Um, We'll have to move well, on. That's fine. Yep. That's, which has been demonstrated to be effect, as effective as, as dialectal behaviour therapy. And you can see there on the screen, I won't go through them, but the general principles, which are about focusing on the individual's priority, focusing on the here and now, and not just attending to emotions, but also attending to the relationship itself, and recognising that hospital is not always contraindicated, that judicious use of uh, hospital can be a helpful uh, uh, tool in the armamentarium. Thank you very much, Andrew. Dr. A Andrew Channon from Melbourne, a psychiatrist from Melbourne. And now we'll hear from uh, Dr. Chris Lee, a uh, psychologist with uh, great experience in, experience in managing borderline personality disorder from Perth. And we'll just move you on to your first slide, um, Chris. Thank you very much. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is one of the therapies that has been specifically designed for treating borderline personality. Chris, could I just, sorry, there's just a little bit of a fall off uh, with the distance, I think. If you can just speak a little bit louder. Okay, um, or if I go down like that, is that better? Yeah, that's lovely, thanks. Okay. Um, there are a number of psychotherapies that have been found to be effective in treating borderline personality disorder. I'm just going to focus on one because it has a really interesting thing to say about multidisciplinary approaches. So. Dialectical behaviour therapy began about 23 years ago, and it began as, a, as cognitive behaviour therapy. So Marsha Linehan and a group of researchers tried to apply CBT to borderline personality disorder. So something that works effectively for depression and panic, but quickly found it didn't work in borderline personality disorder. 
But what they added, and Andrew and uh, Jen have both mentioned this, they found that they needed to add it a more extensive validation emphasis. They found that when you try and do cognitive therapy with someone with borderline personality disorder, they've experienced that as invalidating. Someone who's depressed can be asked to maybe think about something differently. If you do it with someone with borderline personality disorder, they can feel that they're not understood or that they're being attacked for having their beliefs. And what Linehan found in the histories of people with borderline personality disorder is extensive invalidation experiences. The next thing that her and her colleagues added is a dialectical philosophy. Put uh, simply, for every idea in the world, there's, that's a thesis. There's always the opposite of that, the antithesis. And the dialectical process is when you synthesize these two. Now, those of you working with borderline personality disorder know that they think a lot in dichotomous ways. It's very hard for them to see the gray. And having a dialectical philosophy can be really helpful to help them navigate through the problems that they're experiencing in life. So to give an example of a patient from two weeks ago, she began the session by saying, all GPs are bastards. And by the end of the session was talking about how she'd fallen in love with her uh, new uh, GP. So the last uh, thing that was added to dialectical behavior therapy is mindfulness and some skills to particularly deal with the uh, problems that people with borderline personality disorder have. Mindfulness was borrowed from the Tibetan Buddhist approach particularly useful in borderline personality disorder because unfortunately for most of them they spend their lives... I'm sorry Chris, um, um, we're just having difficulty in hearing you, I'm very sorry to interrupt you but could, would, could you please um, just raise your volume a little bit, thank you. Okay, what about if I do that, is that better? That's much better, thanks, okay. that's really good. Um, with the, just to add mindfulness, which is kind of like the opposite of what they're trying to do, which is normally to not experience emotions in their life to not experience uh, painful thoughts. Now, as Andrew mentioned, there are four domains in borderline personality disorder. Dialectical behavior therapy, as the slide suggests, focuses a lot on the emotional um, dysregulation. So the, oh, the slides are slow. Well, maybe if I keep uh, talking about it. There's actually um, a couple of things that seem to influence emotional dysregulation. There's a strong uh, biological uh, influence. The work of Bessel van der Kolk shows us that, um, uh, that trauma has a direct effect on brain functioning, particularly the hippocampus. We know that people that have been traumatized have smaller hippocampuses compared to controls. And it's also true that for people with borderline personality disorder, that they have smaller hippocampuses matched to other a patient group. So there are things going on in the brain, there are probably some genetic components, and there's probably even intrauterine experiences that affect the patients with borderline personality disorder ability to regulate their emotions. So in addition to that uh, biological arm, there's also the invalidating uh, environment, or the environmental influences have a large part to play. And Linehan has focused a lot on the concept of invalidating environment. So I'm just going to explain uh, briefly because it's important to uh, adapt your treatment to take into this into account. So what happens is an invalidating environment is one in which parents uh, or the major caregivers don't uh, necessarily mirror the child's uh, responses. They often might be erratic or inappropriate or give extreme responses to situations. So I'll give you an example. If a child comes in from play and is crying and the parent says, shut up or I'll give you something to cry about, that would be an invalidating response. Or alternatively, what um, they might say... Ex excuse me, Chris. Yeah. I'm just having a lot of feedback that they're not hearing any sound. I was... that the, the attendees are not hearing any sound. I was wondering if you could just raise your voice really loud and see if we can hear that. Uh, <clears throat> I'm just not sure whether the sound's dropped out or whether it's... Um, right. Uh, could, could you just raise your voice a little bit more? Okay, I will try. Thank uh, you very much. The, uh, so I was talking about invalidating environments, or another example of invalidation would be to say to the child, um, you're never happy in response to their crying. So 
A validating response, by contrast, would be to say to the child, what's wrong? That communicates a lot of things. It teaches the child that when they're upset, something has just happened to make them upset. It teaches them that when you're upset, a good thing to do is to talk about it. This is uh, the opposite of the shut up, uh, you're never happy, I'll give you something to cry about, which punishes the child for communicating distress and, um, and never teaches them an association between things that are happening in the environment and their distress level. So it leads a lot to self-invalidation, which Jan uh, mentioned. I'm going to click forward in the next slide. Thanks, Chris. Um, what are the effects of this invalidation? Well, people with borderline personality disorder often have difficulty labelling their emotional experiences. Um, they just simply haven't had the learning trials to do that. Um, we've already talked about they have self-invalidation. Other um, things that you can see is that um, often when they've been growing up, a lot of their communications of emotional uh, distress have been uh, not paid attention to. But really extreme displays of emotion were sometimes paid attention to. From behaviour theory, this is the worst type of reinforcement. This is intermittent reinforcement of extreme emotional displays. And I think really can account for why some people with borderline personality disorders frequently display over-the-top communication behaviours when a simple request of needs can sometimes suffice. To um, sort of characterise some of our, the theory, according to Linehan, is that emotional dysregulation is central. The sort of things that are important in that is that people with borderline personality are very sensitive to emotional stimuli, they're very reactive to stimuli, and after they have been activated, they take a long time to return to baseline. So we've actually conducted some research to support this idea when we put people on 24-hour heart monitors and looked at their activity levels, what we found is that they were, in fact, more reactive, and more easily triggered, and slower to return to baseline than other patient groups, including people with uh, unstable panic disorder. So, Murray, are you still getting the sound? Um, it's uh, Michael, actually, but uh, I'm still hearing Sam, but we're, what I'm doing is I'm shutting down all the webcams, so nobody will have any, you won't be able to see yourselves anymore in an attempt to in, increase the sound, and I think it's, it has improved already. So I'll just leave my, my face up there. Okay. Uh, so everybody else has been, um, it's just an audio. All right, so let me talk about the, um, one of the things then that's taught in dialectical behavior therapy is emotional management. The patients learn skills to better manage their emotions. One technique that's taught is opposite action. Opposite action means that you do the opposite of what feels natural. So someone who is depressed and has low energy will naturally feel like wanting to go to bed and pulling the cover over their head and not talking to anyone. Yet these are the very behaviours that will exacerbate depression. Someone who's agitated in your office will in fact pace. And the effect of pacing increases the agitation. So we teach the clients to learn to do behaviours that are the opposite of what feels natural. So they actually start to behave in ways independent of their mood. This is really important. They're then able to experience negative emotions without trying to numb them. Or if they experience positive emotions when they get a high, but they don't try and escalate that you know, through drug use or through risky um, behaviour. So experience the negative emotions without numbing, experiencing the positive emotions without trying to escalate them. And in that way, they'll get more of what they want. Life. So going back to the model, the way we change emotional dysregulation is firstly we do a lot of teaching of mindfulness um, skills. So that's not the, uh, and the mindfulness skills are really helpful as I mentioned before to improve self-identity, to change uh, dissociation. We also teach emotional regulation skills and these are designed to target the symptoms of anger and affective uh, lability. Uh, we also teach distress tolerance. Those skills are particularly useful when the person is experiencing a lot of distress and wants to do something impulsive like spend money, uh, gamble, 
uh, self-harm, uh, that they have other ways of managing that distress. And finally, we teach interpersonal skills as part of DPT to help manage those sort of chaotic relationships, help them get more of what they need from their relationships and change those feelings of abandonment. Um, as Andrew uh, pointed out, I think all of the psychotherapies that are designed to treat borderline have an extensive emphasis on validation, and this is really important for changing emotional dysregulation. So most of the therapies kind of say, you know what, it's amazing that someone with borderline personality disorder can get as far as they've got. And it, a lot of the uh, kind of problematic behaviours make sense from the history, that they're angry in situations where they're meant to be trusting of other uh, people because in the past when they trusted they got hurt. So we do a lot of uh, validation of those kinds of behaviours. But our dialectical process is at the same time as doing the validation, we're also teaching skills. So we're saying it is true that you're doing the very best you can and it's also true that you need to be more skillful in situations of your life. And the final part about DBT is a special attention to the therapist uh, relationship. The DBT is a multimodal approach, as I've tried to talk about. It combines biological aspects, social aspects, and, and um, psychological constructs. It really emphasizes, as Andrew also said, the importance of supervision, because therapy with borderline patients, more so than in any other group, is a reciprocal relationship. You affect them, but they definitely um, affect you. And you need to have supervision to, uh, to manage that if you're going to do weekly therapy um, with them. There's a lot about the therapist's style in, in DBT. Uh, attention is paid to being warm, to being actually though vulnerable sometimes with the client, and also an extensive use of humor to balance the uh, warm, the lumen setting, and the uh, vulnerability. And I think that's my 15 minutes. I did have one more slide, so I did put up what I thought were the most useful uh, references. I put up three, Linehan's original um, reference for those of you that are really keen. A book by Ma, which is really handy for anyone who's working in a solo practice situation and wants to know more about things that you might be offer, able to offer someone with dialectical behavior therapy. And the last, um, reference there that should come up shortly is about um, and a study in Australia where dialectical behaviour therapy was applied in a multidisciplinary team way and evidence of its uh, effectiveness. Thank you very much Chris. That was, um, that was very exciting to have uh, DBT explained um, so comprehensively and, and so expeditiously. It was, it was really, really good and I'm sure everybody else feels the same way. Out there. Uh, we'll just move on now to uh, Dr. Christy McAuliffe, a GP from um, from Brisbane. Unfortunately, due to the number of people who've who've elected to to join us tonight, um, and due to bandwidth problems, so we can't have everybody's um, video cam um, showing. So I have got the sound good now, and I've got my video open. I'm I'm really afraid to change it in case something happens. So if you can put up with looking at my face for the rest of this session, of this session um, we'll just stick with that. Now, Christine, are you there? Uh, yes, I am, Michael. I'm just not sure. I've, I've managed to get back into the slides again, um, but I'm not sure whether I have any control over them. Would you like me to move them for you? Uh, why don't we do that, since yep. uh, that seems to be probably the most uh, reliable. I'm just moving to the end of Chris's reference there to Mara, M-A-R-R-A. Um, which he mentioned, um, and is that the beginning of yours or the end of? No, that's the beginning of mine. That's great. Thank you very much. Great. Well, look, thanks very much. Um, from a general practice perspective, uh, I guess the uh, these are individuals uh, who we see uh, in in many situations. They uh, are individuals who struggle to access any uh, specialist mental health service. Um, and in um, cases have been told by special mental health services in the past that there's nothing that they can do for them and uh, that they um, uh, can't access their services. 
So uh, uh, you can uh, certainly understand uh, that, uh, given what Chris has just described, um, the negative effect of that sort of information. These are individuals, we might move to the next slide if we can, thanks. No uh, worries. Individuals who have high levels of need and, and often present with uh, quite challenging behaviours. Uh, as has been discussed, they often find it very difficult to uh, describe what's happening for them or to seek help in uh, with a, a more normal, routine sort of uh, way. Um, and that can present uh, challenges at a, at a number of levels for us, certainly in general practice, but I'm sure um, in other professions as well. Uh, we're certainly challenged at a professional level and, uh, uh, and as Chris mentioned, at a personal level as well. Um, from a purely pragmatic point of view, uh, we're challenged at a practice level. These are individuals who uh, will often fail to, return, to turn up to routine appointments uh, and at times seem to almost routinely present in crisis. Uh, indeed, at, at times it seems they have a sixth sense for the days that uh, are going to be most disruptive uh, uh, to your practice uh, when they present often uh, extremely distressed. And uh, that can uh, uh, be extremely challenging for the entire practice team, from the people on the front desk, uh, your practice nurses who uh, often play a very valuable role in providing care to these individuals. Um, and uh, it can uh, occur in a way which demands immediate uh, attention, regardless of what limits you've tried to put in place in the past. I, I remember one distressed young individual young woman who, if things really uh, became uh, completely intolerable, uh, the first thing we knew about it was uh, we had distressed patients coming into the practice saying that there was a, a young woman collapsed and bleeding outside the surgery. Uh, so her uh, call for help was to lie on the ground outside the door of the surgery, which of course had uh, a significant uh, effect on uh, people entering the surgery. So you not only had their distress to deal with, but distressed patients, and and uh, and usually, uh, uh, you know, I think uh, Jan said their life is in complete turmoil. Your, usually, your practice day has has uh, approached that as well, um, and that does present pragmatic, uh, you know, problems about how you uh, respond in a professional way at a t in a time when you are under a fair bit of pressure yourself uh, from a number of um, uh, direction. Uh, it's understandable that uh, they're often uh, th their behaviours will create uh, significant anxieties and distress amongst their their family and friends as well. And so uh, you also may find yourself trying to uh, juggle their needs in amongst everything else. Uh, next slide, if we could, thanks. So uh, on the average practice day, when you're already fully booked, this can certainly seem uh, overwhelming. Um, overwhelming in dealing with it uh, pragmatically, but also the enormity of the need that sometimes these individuals seem to have. And I think one of the key messages has already been made uh, a couple of times, and that is that it's important to uh, first acknowledge their distress and, and react accordingly to that rather than to the distress that their behaviours might be causing uh, to those around them. Um, and to keep in mind that there are simple and effective things that you can do even when uh, th there really doesn't seem to be much time that you can uh, uh, sort of fashion to, to, to seek to attend to their needs. Um, and um, we've uh, talked a little bit about some of those simple things that you can do even uh, um, in a short period of time, in, in, in a busy day, just trying to sort of acknowledge their distress, deal appropriately and compassionately with often what are self-inflicted wounds, um, and um, uh, involve your team in uh, providing them with, with care. And practice nurses are often uh, very valuable in uh, providing just a, a calm, uh, settling, uh, compassionate uh, response to their presentations, and that can buy you some time from a pragmatic perspective in just trying to juggle the needs of your other um, patients at the same time as uh, dealing with um, an acute crisis. Uh, Michael, we might move on, I think.
That's great. Christine, we only have about uh, two or three minutes left. Right, We're already uh, running a little bit over time. I'm very sorry. That's right. I'll, I'll, I'll speed up. I think uh, one of the, uh, the things that uh, often present uh, challenges in general practice is trying to keep people safe. Um, and uh, as we know, these individuals often do have a, 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 a successful suicide. Uh, um, sorry, they do suicide. It's not a successful suicide. Um, uh, and uh, it is important that we do have some strategies of, of how we manage that. But really, ultimately, uh, it's important as clinicians that we acknowledge that at the end of the day, the safety is in their hands. And um, uh, I think uh, the um, development of a crisis plan uh, is, a, is a really key step in trying to f put some structure around how they might respond uh, in situations where their distress uh, really um, leaves them feeling quite helpless. Um, and it's important that that is shared, if possible, with their family and carers because they can play a key role if they have some practical and, and constructive things to do. Um, and if you're lucky enough to practice in an area where there are other uh, uh, mental health professionals who can uh, add their expertise to the, the team uh, caring for these individuals, it's important to share that uh, plan across the team so that everyone's on the same page and they get a consistent and clear message about how to manage uh, their safety. Michael, next one, thanks. Um, it's really key that we do give a sense of, of help um, but, uh, you know, you can either be the devil or the, the hero uh, at times uh, in their eyes, uh, depending upon uh, what other aspects of uh, their lives are intruding. And it's very important that, uh, that you're really aware of your own uh, response to their behaviours and don't fall into the trap of, of rescuer. And uh, that's not something that just happens to GPs. Uh, I've certainly seen it happen to quite experienced professionals and it gets back to Chris's uh, point. It's important that uh, we seek to work as a team where we can um, and to support each other uh, uh, in providing care. Uh, and I think the, the last uh, message is uh, to take a long-term perspective when you're dealing um, with these individuals. Uh, it, it's amazing what can be achieved over time with um, a consistent uh, supportive and uh, um, uh, empathetic uh, approach to um, uh, supporting them and trying to meet their needs. Thank you very much. That was, uh, this is a really exciting uh, webinar. We've heard uh, from Jan from the consumer point of view. We've heard from Andrew as a psychiatrist. We've heard from Chris um, as a psychologist. And we've heard from um, Christine as a GP. And I already have a greater understanding of of, of how everybody sees the world um, from listening to you all, and I, I really do appreciate you attending tonight. Some common questions that came through, and um, we're just going to go into our p panel questions and answer session now, and you can still send in questions in, by typing into the bottom right-hand corner, and I will relay them to the panel. Common question was uh, differentiating between uh, bipolar affective disorder and other affective disorders and borderline personality disorder. Chris Lee, would you like to um, comment on that? Between borderline personality disorders and... Other and bipolar affective disorder and, and other affective disorders. Yeah, I guess uh, a, a key thing that I think about is the, uh, the affect uh, instability that happens with borderline personality disorder. My, uh, what I look for is the the mood for people with borderline personality disorder is often more like the Melbourne weather. It's dark and stormy in the morning. There's a bit of bright sunshine at uh, midday, uh, and then it's grizzly in the afternoon. So they have these intense affect um, shifts uh, throughout the day. So they often don't, uh, well, some type of, of course, comorbid diagnosis are common, but they're not necessarily meeting the criteria of having a sustained, depressed mood, present every day, full most of the day for an entire two-week a period, and I guess that's the key. Uh, so it's the intensity and the, and the shift. Yes, that's right. Yep. And that's Andrew really might like to comment as well. But the, the other thing with the, I think the, uh, also the tricky part, of course, is the impulsive uh, behaviors, like the gambling and the, um, uh, you know, sexual behaviors that they be getting to quite impulsively, the um, uh, spending money, those kinds of things can uh, also, of course, look like part of um, a manic episode. 
and sometimes those differentiations, I think, are, uh, are quite tricky. Thanks very much, Chris. That's that's really really good. Thank you. Now another common question coming Can through. Comment there, uh, Michael. Yes, Andrew. Yeah, uh, I I think um, one other comment to make is that. Uh, it, specifically in differentiating bipolar disorder from borderline personality disorder, um, you don't get euphoria in, uh, in borderline personality disorder, uh, and the elevated mood is, is quite rare, particularly sustained elevated mood in borderline personality disorder, and differentiates the two. Unfortunately, the two disorders co-occur more often than chance. So you actually can get the bipolar disorder co-occurring with borderline personality disorder. The other means of differentiating borderline personality disorder from major depressive disorder, Chris alluded to this and I'd just like to reinforce, it's the pervasive depressed mood that you get in, in major depression uh, that differentiates it, that you don't get the periods of uh, perhaps just uh, mild dysphoria or dysthymia that you get in uh, in borderline personality disorder. In major depression, you get pervasive depressed mood uh, that's unrelenting going on for weeks. Um, again, you can get co-occurrence of the syndromes, and that's why I emphasized in assessing the disorder that you need to distinguish state from tray. People who just engage in impulsive behaviors or self-harm during pervasive depressed mood and at no other time are unlikely to have borderline personality disorder. They're very, very good points, Andrew. Thank you very much. That's, that's really good. So the euphoria is generally absent. Yeah. Yep. That's really good. Thank you very much. Jan, may I just ask you as a consumer, um, what uh, tips do consumers find, um, what tips could you offer on mitigating self-harm on attendance acutely? Um, that's on attendance with or without self-harm, Michael. This is pre-self-harm? Uh, well, basically it's a, more of a general question on general, general tips that, that, that clients find useful for mitigating self-harm. Okay. Look, uh, clearly I'm not a clinician. But um, I, it, it's my, in my mind, self-harm is around trying to ease that pain uh, or conversely trying to feel something. And there is uh, the release of, of um, uh, emotion, I guess, in the act of self-harm. So in terms of being able to mitigate that, I think that um, uh, as a clinician you shouldn't um, perhaps spend a lot of time in inspecting unless there, of course, uh, it's a, in a surgery where actual suturing is required. Um, but to, to understand uh, and try and reflect on what it is behind the self-harm that's actually causing that activity on that action. Uh, and I think if, you can, if we could look at that and address some of those issues, then I think um, that would certainly mitigate the, the self-harm. And I think, too, is, um, is really requiring the consumer to take um, a degree of responsibility for their actions. Um, and I think to, to use, often to use a, um, a, a, a suggestion that how would you feel if your daughter or your son came to you with, with self-harm? And I think that sort of puts it a little bit more in perspective. And of course, I'd be horrified. But usually, the answer is I'd be horrified. But That's a very good point, Jan. And thank you very much um, again for, for your input into the discussion. Christine, um, may I just ask you um, for some tips as a GP uh, on working with, with the public system in relation to acute presentations? I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm the right person to ask. <laughs> well, from the GP's perspective. Look, um, you know, there, in some places around the country there are now um, services provided through uh, the public sector for people with a diagnosis of borderline personality disorder. But unfortunately... The Sorry, reality... Christine, can I just ask you to speak up a little bit, please? I said, um, can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. There are uh, some services in some places for people with a diagnosis of borderline personality disorder in the public mental health service uh, sector. Unfortunately, the reality for most GPs is they're still very difficult to access. 
um, and um, uh, it, it would probably be a minority of individuals that you would be seeing who would be able to access uh, specialist mental health services publicly for borderline personality disorder. Thank you. Andrew, just going back to you, um, may I ask you um, a common question that we had was the management of the children of, of, um, of patients with, by, with uh, borderline personality disorder. Um, could you give us some tips or hints on that? Sure. There, there is actually some uh, work beginning to be done on this. Children of parents with uh, any mental illness uh, have often been neglected uh, um, by mental health professionals uh, and, again, the wider um, uh, child protective field. And um, I think the principles for dealing with uh, young people is to actually recognize um, the experience that they're having and to take steps toward um, offering uh, uh, both support and protection, but also effective treatment for their parents. Um, and I think that uh, too often um, uh, people uh, in, in positions where they come into contact with children who have a parent with a borderline personality disorder are at a loss as to what to do uh, for the parent. And I think directing them toward uh, effective treatment services is the best thing that can be done, uh, as well as providing support and, if necessary, protection for the children. So what I'm hearing you say is using a multidisciplinary uh, approach. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's important, I think, particularly across uh, non-government sectors and across child protection and mental health for there to be coordination. And unfortunately, that coordination is not there, as, as um, uh, Chris McAuliffe has just said. Um, you know, services for borderline personality disorder are, are patchwork, and often a child protective worker might be seeking assistance, uh, but get the brush off from, uh, from mental health services uh, uh, because uh, they either don't deal with the problem, or if they do, they might not see the... Um, uh, parents' problem as, as being sufficiently severe for them to enter uh, uh, public mental health services. Thank you, Andrew. Just getting back to you, Chris Lee, um, very good question that came through from uh, one of the um, um, people tonight was um, the management in a rural area where you don't have access to good mental health services or any mental health services. Uh, yeah, indeed. That's quite, that's quite a challenge. I think uh, and Michael, in, in Queensland, I'm aware they have quite some uh, innovative ways of, of, of trying to deal with this. Um, one uh, possibility that, be, uh, that I know exists is that there are uh, DBT is administered often in an individual and in a group. If the person has to travel 150 kilometres for their individual session, they don't want to come back two days later and have the 150 kilometres to have their uh, group uh, session. So they've actually been trialling um, Skype as using that as a way to have the group experience of DPT in addition to the, uh, the, the individual uh, experience. So I think, I think it's a fantastic uh, solution. That's good. That's good. So still using the multidisciplinary team. Still using the um, Not taking all the, all the challenges on yourself. Yeah. And using the tried and true proven evidence-based models. Uh, that's still. There, I noticed there was a question before about um, uh, that one of the participants raised and said that if you are going to do DBT, can you just do it in an individual way? This we don't. There's actually no research to show whether or not just doing the individual component and not doing the group is actually effective or not. Although there's a very recent study that shows that you can in fact only deliver the group component and get a positive um, outcome people as long as they're not really severe in the borderline personality disorder thing. Thanks very much, Chris. And just getting back to you, Andrew, um, getting on to pharmacotherapy, um, there were a number of questions coming through uh, during the evening, um, ranging all the way. People were querying whether clozapine, um, uh, Seroquel, um, what, what I realized from the tenor of Everybody's talked tonight that pharmacotherapy should not be the first line of treatment, but could you comment on pharmacotherapy with borderline personality disorder? Sure. I, I think that um, uh, despite 
the uh, evidence-based recommendation that pharmacotherapy is not indicated as a primary treatment, there's an enormous amount of prescribing goes on. And you mentioned Seroquel or quetiapine. That's become uh, particularly commonly prescribed for those who are old enough to remember thyridazine or Melaril. It's really the new Melaril, uh, and every uh, second patient seems to be on it. There is no evidence <coughs> to support the use of those medications uh, as primary treatments for the, those core domains of borderline personality disorder. And in fact, there's evidence to show their lack of effectiveness. There's a very, well, the largest pharmacotherapy trial to date was conducted with olanzapine in borderline personality disorder, a very well conducted trial published in the British Journal of Psychiatry. It was industry sponsored and normally there's a bias toward positive findings in industry-sponsored trials. Even that didn't come up with a positive finding. Mm. So I think that while there are, there are uh, some of the meta-analyses do suggest um, some, uh, I guess, experimental type uh, treatments, I think pharmacotherapy is best conducted by specialists in pharmacotherapy for BPD as a, uh, a kind of second or third uh, level of treatment that on the whole, as frustrating as it may seem, uh, um, uh, pharmacotherapy is really largely unrewarding. And these days, the harms are, are much more um, evident and we're much more aware of them. All those people on uh, uh, quetiapine are at risk of developing the metabolic syndrome. Mm. And the, uh, uh, unfortunately, the health status of people with borderline personality disorder is um, far worse than those of uh, people uh, without personality disorders or many other people with, um, with other mental health conditions. People with borderline personality disorder have particularly poor health. Uh, so what I'm so hearing, maybe, hearing you saying, what I hear you saying, Andrew, is that, that um, similar to other, some other therapies, that um, actually using quetiapine um, is worse than placebo. It's, it actually has negative effects. Uh, yes, I think in terms of, uh, of the metabolic syndrome, it certainly yeah. does. Yeah. You know, there are some small positive trials for atypical antipsychotics. Mm. There was some enthusiasm for fluoxetine mm. uh, for impulsive behaviours, but mm. the evidence has not really come out. The more trials that have been published and uh, the more meta-analyses that mm. have been conducted. And, and the most extreme uh, recommendation is just don't do it. Yeah. But I think if you are going to do it, review it regularly sure. and call an end to it if it's not working. Oh, that's, that's, that's really good advice. Thank you very much. Well, believe it or not, we have reached the stage of the evening where I'm going to give everybody three minutes to, uh, on the panel to sum up, and then I will sum up at the end. Um, so we might just go back to you again, Jan, um, if you could um, give us your three minutes. Please. Yes. Um, Thank you, Michael. Look, uh, from a consumer perspective, um, I understand that there are around 250 clinicians on this webinar and, and I'm very grateful that you've taken the time out of your busy days to, to, um, to dial into this, uh, this webinar around this particular issue. Um, I think that the points that I'd like to get across um, would be as clinicians to have an understanding that that this disorder, borderline personality disorder, is um, is more than the person themselves. So in other words, what I would ask is that you look past those challenging behaviours and you look to see the individual. You look to see that they are distressed, you look to see that their distress is real, um, and you look to, to try and have some sort of an understanding that um, that these behaviours that you see um, are not, ne they're certainly not the, um, uh, seeking your attention but they are efforts, desperate efforts to ease that, either that pain or indeed to feel something. So um, I think that uh, the, the other presenters have made some fabulous points. Um, I found myself thoroughly agreeing with with, um, with Andrew Channon on many of the points that he made. I found myself agreeing with um, Chris Lee on many of the points he made and I certainly understand the challenges for Christine McCullough from the GP perspective. It's not an easy 
um, uh, group of people to to be able to treat and and for for many to actually even like, I suspect. But I do thank you that you've at least shown the interest to be joining this webinar tonight, and um, and I think that augurs very well for future treatment and care for for these folk who are finding it very difficult to be able to access. Um, appropriate and good quality treatments. So thank you for that, Michael. Thank you very much, John, and we certainly appreciate your skill and knowledge as well. It, it's certainly been very illuminating. Andrew, I might just turn to you now and ask you to present for three minutes, just in summing up, please. Yep. Uh, well, again, I'd like to in, endorse the, um, the positive tone of this evening, that I think the main points that, um, that I've, I've got from this evening, but also that I'd like to, to reinforce, uh, are, they, are that treatment is effective, that people should approach people with borderline personality disorder with a sense of hope and optimism. And in fact, I think the first lesson is that once you stop arguing with people uh, uh, and trying to push them away from your practice, that they're an extremely rewarding group to work with uh, and that uh, they do improve. I think that although there are uh, evidence-based treatments, and I, I conduct uh, um, trials and evidence-based treatments myself, um, the, majority, the, the number of people with borderline personality disorder is too great to ever be able to deliver um, those uh, treatments to every person. And I'd like people to take away some of the general principles of practice that I think Chris McAuliffe also underlined um, that uh, involve access to services, understanding the disorder itself, educating people about the disorder, assessing people thoroughly, um, being non-judgmental, validating in, in, uh, in the terms that, uh, that Chris Lee described, uh, and uh, providing structure and consistency, um, as well as attending to practical problems, problem solving, as Chris McCall has said, uh, treating co-occurring problems where they occur, uh, and getting support for yourself when you engage in, uh, in treating uh, individuals with borderline personality disorder, finding some way to get support uh, so that you don't uh, have to endure the burden of, of this yourself and where possible to work within a multidisciplinary team. Thank you very much, Andrew. I, I think that last point uh, is a very important point, that one needs to have support oneself as if one is uh, working with with patients with borderline uh, personality disorder. Now, Chris Lee, I'll just ask you to present for three minutes, Chris, um, in summing up. Um, I've probably got three points to make, not necessarily in summary, but I think three key things um, to say. One is the importance, if you can, and if you're going to do therapy, to be part of the team. Sorry, Chris, um, you're just fading out a little bit there. I think I need to speak up just a tiny bit. now? Yes, that's much better. Okay. Is, uh, to be part of the team. This uh, has been the most, uh, working with borderline personality disorder as part of the team has been one of the most rewarding things that I've done in a career. You'll have team members who are really good at validating uh, clients and you'll have other team members that are really good at teaching mindfulness and other team members that are really good at uh, teaching emotional regulation skills. And the different disciplines seem to have particular strengths in some of these different uh, areas. So I really do think that the combined team approach uh, really has a benefit for those at the more severe end. As Andrew pointed out, not everybody uh, kind of like needs the, the state of the art and intensive team, but it's, it's, it's fantastic when you, you get the opportunity to do that. The second thing I'd like to comment on is just one of the um, members of the audience asked about people with borderline personality disorder researching their own um, things on the web would like to make a comment like that. Mostly, I found that to be a positive experience. Unfortunately, some people find websites that are, are really very punitive about borderline personality disorder and based on way outdated information, saying things like nothing works. This can be extremely demoralizing for someone with borderline personality disorder. It's just not true. Um, so sometimes when a, a, a patient is going off to do that, you might warn them that there is outdated and inappropriate information available. But for most of them, they get a greater sense of connection, uh, understanding that there are a set of symptoms that a lot of people have, and they're actually part of a, a group, which is great for their general sense of disconnection. And the final question I just saw that came up that I wouldn't mind commenting on is that one of the uh, audience members asked about the therapeutic alliance 
and is that the most important part of the therapy? Therapeutic allowance is a very important part, but it looks like there are some things about the therapeutic alliance related to the model that's important. So in DBT, we actually know that, yes, it's really important that the um, patient feels understood and validated, for sure. The other thing that's really important is that the therapist balances this continued validation with teaching skills. And people that just focus on trying to teach borderlines how to better manage their life or only do validation don't seem to do as, as well. So I just have those comments. Can you just clarify that last point again for me, Chris? So people who just do validation... Yeah. In, what, what, in one of the larger um, studies that Linehan conducted, they looked at videotapes of what happened in therapy. And therapists who were sitting there are only doing validation but never actually teaching the person to mindfulness or how to regulate emotions or better communication skills, those patients tended not to recover so much. People who focus the entire session on just trying to get the person with borderline personality disorder to be more skillful and just keep teaching them those things and without the validation, those people also didn't do so well. Yes. So the optimal group um, had therapists who balanced those two so what you're saying is that we really do need a multidisciplinary uh, approach, and and it's either give it all or don't give don't give individual parts of it on its own. No, I, I'm not saying that. Actually, you can uh, give the individual part, but you have to pay attention to uh, those validation and teaching the skills within your individual sessions. I think that that is still a very effective thing to do. Yes, I can hear what you're saying. Thank you very much. Christine, okay. would you like to um, spend three minutes um, summing up? Yes. Look, uh, it, the burden of disease uh, with borderline personality disorder is, is firmly carried by the, the individuals themselves and their families. Um, it, it presents challenges for us as clinicians, but I think uh, it's really important that we have a, a very optimistic outlook, as other speakers have spoken about, uh, with respect to engaging in their care. Um, in an ideal world, uh, it would be great to have actors across the multidisciplinary team to meet their needs, and, and these are individuals with high levels of needs and very genuine needs, and uh, you know, I look forward to a day when our system is a bit more uh, uh, validating of, of, the, the, um, um, of, their, of their suffering and uh, more responsive to their needs uh, right across the country. But in... Um, in 2011, uh, one uh, big uh, advantage has been the uh, increase in access to um, uh, specialist mental health service providers in primary care, and uh, I think that's been uh, a huge boon um, in providing care to individuals. Uh, but it, it still remains that for most of these individuals, their primary caregiver will be their GP, and uh, they may not be... Uh, uh, able to access specialist mental health service providers um, for a whole lot of reasons. The message I'd like to leave with GPs is this is uh, something, despite the challenges, that is very rewarding um, to be involved with. Um, think about using your practice team um, uh, if you don't have access to a broader um, mental health uh, team uh, to assist you in their care. And don't underestimate the effectiveness of um, consistent uh, uh, approach to meeting their needs. Uh, there are simple, effective things that you can do in a busy general practice that really will make a big difference to the, these people in their lives, and you will see good outcomes over time. And I think that's the key message that uh, I'd like to leave with my colleagues, that, uh, uh, that uh, there's a, a very good outcome for many individuals with borderline personality disorder if they are, are able to access care. Thank you, Christine. So what I'm hearing you say is that in general practice, using the multidisciplinary approach, using the mental health care plan, using mental health nurse, OT, social worker, psychologist uh, to, to refer to, using the team approach is a better way of going than trying to manage it yourself. If you're fortunate enough to have access to those uh, individuals, and, and as yep. I said, fortunately these days they're more available in many communities. Um, and uh, I'd encourage people to, uh, to link in with their local service providers where, where available. 
but um, yep. if you aren't uh, fortunate enough to have uh, those people uh, supporting you, and particularly in rural uh, and regional areas sometimes that is uh, uh, less accessible, um, then don't feel like there's nothing that's worthwhile that you can do. Uh, that's there are some good. simple, really effective good. things you can do even in a busy general practice. Thank you very much. Well, listen, I would like to, to thank our panel, and um, I'm going to get everybody out there, all uh, 220 of you who are still left, to clap, and we'll see if we can hear you. Thank you. Um, Jan, thank you very much for your, um, for your um, approach to presenting this uh, and for providing the human um, experience of um, somebody um, who has experienced um, mental illness in the past. Thank you, Mark. All pleasure. Um, Andrew, thank you very much for your um, for your uh, input. I particularly enjoyed um, the, the the management principles that you enunciated, and um, the importance of access. Um, assessment and being particularly non-judgmental, that's what I took away mostly from your talk and, you know, the the care that we need to use uh, with using pharma pharmacotherapy. Chris, that was a marvellous exposition of DBT and um, it all makes sense now to me um, and I'm sure it was illuminating to, to everybody who who is um, on broadband tonight with us. Um, I think the, your points about people going onto websites was, was good, and I think we need to accept that as, as practitioners and to work with it uh, uh, in developing the therapeutic alliance. Christine, um, your input as a GP was, 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 was fantastic. Um, you gave us all an insight to the problems that GPs experience with patients with, with borderline personality disorders, and you also gave us um, an algorithm for for, for, for dealing with it using using the mental health uh, plan and uh, a multidisciplinary team approach. So in summary, I'm going to finish off tonight by telling you that we will have all these assets available on the MHPN online at, m at www.mphn.org.au uh, and just follow the uh, prompts to get to where they are. Uh, we had two learning objectives tonight. The first was to recognize the ways in which clinicians and or treatment teams may be challenged when providing mental health treatment and care to borderline personality disorder presentations. And the second was to acquire strategies to build individual and team resilience. I do hope that you have all um, reached those objectives tonight and we shall pursue it further online. Thank you very much for your patience tonight and for, uh, for logging in. And thank you, panel, so much for your expertise, experience, and um, presentations. Welcome. Thank you. Michael. Thanks. Take care now. Everybody drive safely home. Hello, Chris speaking. Hello. Hello, Michael. Hello. Is, is that Hello. Nikki? Hello. Hello, Christine. Yes, yeah, speaking, Michael. Oh, sorry. No, I, I don't know what's happened there. Ah, uh, you just rang me, so I'm not quite sure how that. Rang <laughs> <happened. laughs> me too. Okay. Take cheers. care. Bye, man. Bye. See you.